Welcome to the Grit.org podcast with Colby Harris and Brian Harbin. In these episodes, they speak to top achievers in athletics and business to understand the habits and mindset they apply in order to build more grit. All right, welcome back to the Grit.org podcast. My name is Colby Harris. Alongside me, as always, is Mr. Brian Harbin, and we are here with today's guest, Adam Silva. Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Adam was raised in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He played four years of Division I lacrosse for Army West Point before spending 10 years as an Army officer. Since then, Adam has worn many hats in his professional life, but it all comes down to one thing, leadership. Adam is a certified executive coach, team builder, leadership consultant, and organizational health and culture expert. He is currently the director of franchise operations for Superior Fence and Rail Franchising, the director of player development for lacrosse at Jacksonville University, and is an assistant coach for Bulls Boys Varsity Lacrosse. We are thrilled to have him here today to share his stories while as enrich all of you at home as, as to how you can be a better leader, employee, parent, or player. So Adam, can you take us back to the beginning and really just share more about your parents, your upbringing, maybe some of the advantages or disadvantages you had around your home as you were growing up? Yeah, so thanks again for having me. Um, can't tell you how excited I am to be here and how much I believe in what you guys are doing uh, with Grit. Um, so my father uh, and mother um, come from very different backgrounds. Um, my grandparents on my dad's side were both middle school dropouts, and they're my heroes. My my vavu, that's Portuguese for grandfather, was uh, worked making ice cream for 30-some years and was also a janitor uh, part-time for two doctors that we're still friends with to this day. Uh, my vovó, my Portuguese grandmother, was a seamstress uh, who actually medically retired early because of arthritis. And so she basically was a, a homemaker, but also worked as a maid uh, for both of those doctors as well. Uh, and so I often say that my heroes are the janitor and the maid, uh, mm-hmm. which is uh, most people are like, I don't understand exactly what that means. But they're the two uh, people who outside of my parents loved me the most uh, and taught me as much about family and, and love as, as anyone else. And then on my, my mother's side, uh, very different. My grandfather was a PhD candidate and a high school principal, a lifelong educator, but they divorced when my mother was 20. Uh, and so we had, back then when that was you know quite uncommon, we had two sets of grandparents on my, my mom's side. And the reason I mention that is because we were very much raised by our, our family. Um, a lot of time spent in Massachusetts. We moved to Virginia when I was six, I think, five or six. My dad rejoined the active army, and um, but we always went back to Massachusetts and specifically New Bedford uh, from Memorial Day to Labor Day. That was our thing, and and so I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. And um, I'm the oldest of four. Uh, my brother Nate is a cop here in Jacksonville. He's married to my sister-in-law Tina. She's a nurse. Um, my sister Becky is a teacher, and she's married to Dan, and he's a retired JSO officer. And my baby sister, Shelly, is a labor and delivery nurse, and she's married to Keith, and he's a teacher. So it's a pretty tight-knit family that we have here in Jacksonville. We're all about 10 miles away from each other. Uh, Ten grandchildren running around somewhere, um, ranging in age from my son, Miles, who's 25, uh, all the way down to to Addie. And I can't remember how old she is now. So, yeah. It sounds like a very close-knit family, and I love what you said, too, about your grandparents, too, with the janitor and the maid just definitely shows a lot of your humility and where that stems from. And uh, so take us back specifically to sports. I mean, where did your passion for sports, you know, start? Was it always lacrosse? So tell us a little bit about, you know, sports growing up for you and what you learned from it. Yeah, so the, the, the four of us, when it comes to sports, you know, again, I was born in 1971, and times were a lot different. I'm 51 years old now. My mother was the driving impetus behind us being athletes. And I'm, again, the oldest of four. All four of us were multiple sport athletes as kids and up through high school. Um, My brother, Nate, and my sister, Becky, are both college athletes. Uh, Nate was a a two-sport athlete at JU. He played basketball and soccer. Mm -hmm. And my sister, Becky, uh, played college basketball. And uh, my mother was 5'10". And so, and she was born in 1949. So when you were a woman and 5'10", back then, you were a tall woman. She also happened to be a multi-sport athlete at a time when women were not only not encouraged, but in many cases discouraged 
um, from playing sports, and she was uh, basketball, field hockey, and tennis. She's a fantastic swimmer. Um, and so when we were kids and we moved to Fort Meade, Maryland, I, I was entering the first grade and I didn't even know that we were going to play sports until my mother basically said, get in the car <laughs> and took me to soccer practice. And so at six years old, I was introduced to rec, you know, rec soccer on, on post at Fort Meade and then played soccer, basketball and baseball pretty much my whole childhood. Got really heavy into soccer and then found lacrosse uh, when I was a freshman in high school. But again, my brother and sisters and I all very much, and my dad was very passionate about sports, um, but it, were it not for my mother, I don't know that any of us would have you know, achieved what we did as athletes. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and that's really interesting to hear that you didn't start playing lacrosse till freshman year of high school. And it's really cool, too, because I always advocate for kids at camp, you know, play as many sports as you can, work all your fast twitch muscles, you know, work on hand-eye coordination. So for you to start playing lacrosse freshman year of high school and just four short years later be playing Division One at Army West Point, can you dive further into that and tell us more about lacrosse specifically, how you got into it, and when you really realized you wanted to play at a collegiate level one day? I, I saw kids in my neighborhood playing. So I, I where I was raised, we knew about lacrosse, but we didn't have a youth lacrosse program. And so, and that oftentimes is the differentiator between great high school programs and not, is if you've got a youth feeder program that feeds into the high school, a great example is, you know, Ponte Vedra uh, down here, they have a fantastic feeder program that feeds the high school. Well, I didn't have the benefit of that, but I saw kids in the neighborhood with lacrosse sticks. So I saved up some money. And for one of my birthdays, I think in the seventh grade, I bought myself a lacrosse stick. Um, and my mother would never let me play football because my dad had a, a really bad knee injury when I was a baby. And so she swore her sons would never play football, but she didn't know what lacrosse was. And so I kind of snuck that one in uh, behind her. And uh, I kept, you know, just played with this, uh, the, the stick, played catch, you know, go out, you know, find a wall, you know, do random things. And then my freshman year in high school decided to try out for the team. And um, I ran into a coach by the name of Tom Singleton, who's still a dear friend of mine to this day. Uh, and he gave me my first defensive poll uh, on the first, second day of tryouts. Mm. Um, and it was a gift that literally changed the trajectory of my life. Back then, you could start you know, the sport if you were athletic or had a passion for it in the ninth grade. It's a little bit harder now because kids are starting you know, so young. Um, those that specialize, I think, do themselves a disservice. But those also tend to be the kids with the greatest skill and experience and IQ in the game. So it's, 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 it's an interesting conundrum. Um, but I always say to kids, and we, we've had some kids when I coached at Ponte Vedra who had really never played before, or if they did, it was one or two years of middle school. But if you're an athlete and you're a competitor and you're willing to be a great teammate and you've got a smart high school coach, they will find a place for you no matter what the role is. So. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously played all four years, obviously did really well. So I'm guessing if you got an offer to play at West Point, you had other offers as well. So tell us about kind of the decision to play at West Point and then why specifically the, the Army. So you would think that, right? Um, I Back then, this was even kind of the front edge of VHS and beta tapes. So and we did we couldn't afford those things. So I, I didn't have tapes to send coaches. And my high school was so bad at lacrosse that I couldn't pay a coach to come recruit me. Um, and so th it's a long story, which I won't bore you with. But the, the, the other place that I got recruited to play lacrosse was the Naval Academy. I was actually a soccer recruit at West Point. And I, I know I look like an, a, a retired uh, offensive tackle right now, but um, th it was not army to play lacrosse it was army to play soccer but i fell in love with the sport and and really had a great senior year even on a losing team and so when i got to west point i made the decision to walk on to the lacrosse team hmm. which did not please the soccer coach um, but i honestly had no idea you know the decision i was making as it related to the soccer coach and so i kind of stumbled into the lacrosse program and once i got into the program for me it was you know survive in advance every day trying to make the team then trying to earn playing time then trying to you know hopefully contribute um, and it was, a, again, the greatest decision I ever made as an athlete was to pursue lacrosse. Mm -hmm. um, to this day, good friends with a lot of the soccer guys, but the lacrosse guys, I, I, I found a home. Uh, and so for me, I had very unique, you know, all the other guys in my class, we brought in 21 guys in that class and seven of us played for four years and graduated. So mm -hmm. we lost two thirds of our class. Not all of them left the academy. 
Uh, but a lot of guys that were much more sought out and recruited than I was, you know, ended up not com- completing the four years, which is something I talk to kids about all the time now, which, you know, make sure you make the right choice to, at the right school. You know, if you can't play the game, if you get cut, if you get hurt, um, you got to make sure you've, you found the right home. And, and I think I did. Yeah. And that really leads right into my next question. I'm twice as fascinated now to hear your response, not knowing originally when we came in that you were actually a walk-on on the lacrosse team. That was something I wasn't aware of. I thought you had an offer and that's where you went to play cut and dry. That's how it worked out. But I'm really interested to hear what was it like for a day in the life at West Point as not only an athlete, but now you're earning your spot, you're earning your time on the team. I feel like every day that's just a constant grind when you're a walk-on. Uh, and you also have to uphold all the requirements on campus for the things you do at West Point. So can you tell us a little bit more about the day in the life as an athlete there and also just a student? So the the beginning of the experience there is, is our day, a reception day. And that's that's basically the day they shave your head and you participate in your first parade and, and you know, get hazed unmercifully for, uh, you know, 24, well, not 24 hours, but all day. It feels like 24 hours. And then that is the first day of Beast Barracks. And so from day one, you know, you wake up the next morning, you're, you're out on the PT field or on the plane doing PT. Um, very structured from very early in the morning until very late at night. Um, you know, they feed you well and they give you enough. Well, they did, they starved me for about three weeks, but then, you know, they take care of you physically and literally what they do there is they break you down. That's part of the reason why they shave, you know, your head. Everybody looks the same. It doesn't matter who you were when you were in high school, you know, you're now a plebe or a new cadet and you are no better or worse than the, the, the man or woman next to you. And that starts the process of, of a very long four years. And, you know, a lot of times talking about West Point, especially being now removed almost 30 years, I can, you know, romanticize the experience. But having two sons who have just one completed West Point and now one's at the Naval Academy, it is a it's an arduous process. And it it really you think plebe year is the worst. It really never ends because the further you get down the road, the more the narrow the road becomes. You know, as a plebe, you have a lot of ability to make mistakes and you make mistakes the whole four years there. But, you know, that's part of their learning curve. But as you get further and closer to graduation, the mistakes you make can be even more costly. So um, for me, being a a cadet was was a a great honor and and a great privilege, but it was also a grind. And then when you add in Division One athletics, we were a year-round sport, even though fall wasn't as, as demanding as the spring. But we were lifting, practicing, or doing agilities pretty much all, you know, both semesters. And so, you know, you're getting up as a plebe at 5.30 in the morning. You're reading the New York Times. You're studying your knowledge, the menu for the day. You're getting your uniform ready. And you go through, you know, a light load for us was 16 and a half credits as plebes. Um, so you're talking about five classes plus a lab. And then there were gym classes throughout the year. Um, there were several semesters where we had 19, 19 and a half credits. And then you're practicing for three and a half hours every day. And so, you know, going there, the one good thing is you never had to worry about your teammates being in shape because <laughs> we were constantly moving and climbing stairs and doing field stuff in the summer. Uh, but the, the biggest challenge there was keeping guys, you know, dialed in emotionally because it, you know, like I said, we started with 21, we finished with seven and uh, it, it really was, it, it's a challenge. So. Wow. And, you know, really the idea is to break you down as individuals to build you back up as a unit, right? That's right. Um, And then you go on to serve, you know, 10 years uh, in the military as an officer. Tell us about that experience, you know, some of the the takeaways you had from 10 years serving the country. Yeah, so I, I was commissioned in 1993. And technically, my military service was 11 years, but it, the there was only two two years of active duty service. And so I commissioned in 93, uh, took a couple of weeks of leave, went to airborne school, uh, fell out of planes five times, uh, went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, became a field artillery officer, went up to Fort Riley, Kansas with the 1st Infantry Division, uh, spent a couple years there. And then I took the balance of my commitment and served it in the National Guard and the Reserve. So I ended up leaving Fort Riley with my wife, Jen, in uh, May of 95 and joined in the 40th Infantry Division of the California National Guard. And we spent a couple years in California. And then when I came to Florida, uh, they literally didn't have any spots for lieutenants back then uh, because back then nobody was getting out of the, the Guard or the Reserve. So they put me on what's called the Inactive Ready Reserve and that's where I spent the balance of my time. Um, I, you know, I have, uh, to be brutally honest, I have mixed feelings about my Army experience. Um, you know, when you're at West Point, 
you know, it's like a love hate relationship and you think, wow, West Point is broken and it's screwed up. And, you know, when you're 20 years old, you discount the 200 years of history uh, at West Point uh, at your own peril. Then you get into the army and you're like, wow, West Point was pretty squared away. Right. And then you get into the National Guard and you're like, wow, the army was pretty squared away. And so I learned a lot of what not to do at every level, you know, from first detail B squad leader as a plebe to, you know, leaving the, the active duty to uh, spending time in the guard. And, and I talk to my, my kids about that a lot is that as leaders, you can learn as much of what the leader you want to be by paying attention to those you don't want to be like. Uh, and, and, you know, again, I, I have great respect for our armed services. Um, great. Obviously, if I didn't, I wouldn't have sent my sons there. Um, I wouldn't have married a woman uh, from West Point in the army. Uh, but I will also tell you that for me, my experience was I wanted to listen and keep my eyes open. And I learned more about what I didn't want to do than what I did. And um, that, that may sound very counterintuitive. And most people don't say it that way. But for me, that was the experience. No, I love that. I think that's a very real approach, honestly. I mean, just as much as you pay attention to people you want to be like, it's a lot easier to kind of point fingers and pick out the things that you don't want to be like. So I just want to take a quick step back real quick. You mentioned your wife was also at Army West Point. So can you tell us a little bit more about meeting her, what that relationship's meant to you for the last 30 or so years now, um, and, and really how you guys met? There? Yeah, yeah. So my wife was not uh, hard to pick out. Uh, back when we wore dark green camouflage and, and buckets, you know, she had uh, platinum blonde hair, naturally sun bleached hair. Um, from, she's a California girl. My, I, my wife's from the San Fernando Valley. She went to Chatsworth High School. Um, you know, tall, blonde, in these, you know, uniforms. And I was like, wow, I'd be nice if I got to meet her some, you know, at some point, you know, at, and who knows when. And then one of the guys on the lacrosse team knew her and because uh, they were in the same company and he introduced us and we started dating Labor Day of our plebe year. So we've been together since, uh, together since uh, September of 1989. Oh, uh, she was the captain of the volleyball team at West Point and uh, I think two years, all Patriot League, um, just fantastic athlete. She, my wife was an all city softball player in Los Angeles, which, you know, I mean, there aren't been many better softball areas in the country and uh, they begged her to play at West Point. She just didn't have the time. And um, we got married a month after we graduated and we've been together ever since. So That's awesome. I love too, I think there's a lot to be respected. You yourself as an athlete, seeing the discipline out of her as a former athlete as well, it's something that you learn in sports that is just priceless for the long term. Uh, so the next question I really wanna ask is, you have an extensive background in sales and team leadership. But a lot of it really started in about 03, 04, 05 when you were working with the Wounded Warrior Project, which is one of the most notable charities in the U.S. Uh, for all their work they do with veterans and people who have served. So can you tell us a little bit more about your time there, especially as it was in the early stages of their foundation? So what did you do there and what was really your role in growing it and helping further their mission? Sure. Yeah. So first off, my wife, Jen, is still the chief program officer at Wounded Warrior Project. And uh, so she leads about two thirds of the, the, the team there. Um, I can't remember now exactly how many programs and services they offer, but she's got probably 20 offices spread out throughout the United States, uh, spending a lot of money on warriors and their families, doing a lot of uh, support and services for them. And I'm really proud of the work that she and the team there have continued. Um, I joined, so WWP was founded in 03. I think it moved to Jacksonville in 06, maybe, maybe late 05. And a friend of mine and I did a lacrosse uh, benefit back in the spring of 2008. And we brought uh, Delaware and UMBC down to play a lacrosse game at Fletcher High School. Uh, we put about 5,000 people in the stands and we said, look, we're not doing this for the money. Whatever money we are able to raise, we want to give to a charity. And a good friend of mine now, who I, I knew a little bit then by the name of John Fernandez, uh, had given both of his legs in a friendly fire incident during the invasion into Iraq back in 2003. Uh, he was the captain of the Army lacrosse team in 01. And so I knew John as a fellow captain. And uh, when I heard about his injuries, I immediately started to follow his story. And I heard about this organization called Wounded Warrior Project that was helping John. And so they did the grand opening here, which is right off of AC Skinner Parkway. It's a couple miles from here. Uh, back in 07, we were planning the event. I went to the grand opening, met the staff, and then we made a pitch to have them as our charitable beneficiary for the lacrosse game in February. 
And at that time, they said, look, what are you doing? And I was in between jobs. And I said, I'm, you know, kind of looking for the next thing. And a couple weeks later, they asked me to join the team. Um, that was in the fall of 2007. I joined the team as the director of people, which is a funny name for the HR guy. And uh, I don't have an HR background, but what they wanted was a team builder and a coach, somebody to help them with mission, vision, values, and culture, which has obviously become my passion now. And I was in that, that uh, role for about six or seven months. And the COO, a guy by the name of Steve Nardizzi, fantastic guy, great leader, eventually became our CEO, asked me if I'd be interested in taking over the fundraising team. And uh, at the time, we were raising about $25 million. We only had, including me, I think there were four of us on the fundraising side, and then a, a partner of ours that did our direct response. Um, and by the time, six years later, when I moved into the chief program officer role, uh, we were raising just, just over $400 million with about 55 teammates on the fundraising side. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm proud of that, not because of the numbers, but because behind every one of those dollars was a warrior, a family member, a spouse, a, a military child who was being taken care of and served in some capacity. And so, you know, we used to say all the time, we don't raise money for the sake of raising money. We raise money to fuel our programs and our programs save and change lives. And so, you know, I take very little credit for our growth and very little credit for our impact because the impact was delivered by our program team. Um, I was at the right place at the right time. And if, if I did one thing that I will take a little bit of credit for is that I hired great people. Mm -hmm. And we brought great people on. We were, we were passionate about not allowing egos to get in the way. Uh, we were passionate about making sure that the mission was kept at the forefront. Uh, we were passionate about making sure that we embodied our core values and our word and our deeds to serve wounded warriors and their families. Um, and it was never about the next article, never about the next magazine cover or television interview. That was not ever anything we, we cared about as, as leaders there. It was about that man or woman laying in a hospital bed somewhere whose life had been changed forever. Um, and that is something that I know they continue to focus on to this day. Mm -hmm. And I know from what you're saying, it sounds like your experience with that definitely helped you live the having a purpose greater than yourself, which I know you'll touch on here in a little bit. Um, and professionally over the years, you have worked in consultant roles, um, you know, currently working as the uh, director of franchise for one of the Inc. 5000 fastest growing fence companies in, in America. Uh, what would you say? I'm curious, you know, at this point, you've been a college athlete, you know, West Point, Army officer, uh, wounded warrior. What would you say, it, it, you know, is your greatest, you know, business skill and how you've kind of leveraged that to, you know, help you be successful professionally? So, oh, boy. That's a good one. I, I, and, and I struggle with that because I, it's, I'm not comfortable talking about me, you know, about what's your, you know, strength or skill. It's, I, I'm, I'm horrible in interviews. Um, it, and maybe that's it. It's, it's not about me. And my, if, if, if I'm going to acknowledge or affirm that that's one of my better skills now, I will tell you that's only because it was a glaring weakness early on. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't mention about West Point, I was talking to a friend a few years ago and he's like, what's the greatest lesson you learned from West Point? And he was shocked when I told him I learned how to fail. It was the greatest lesson. And again, I don't think you can talk about grit without talking about failure. And, and, I, and I don't want to get off on a tangent, but we don't do our kids a service anymore because we're helicopter parents, snowplow parents, not letting our kids fail. And then when they do blaming somebody else for that failure, rather than looking at it as a learning opportunity. Um, but for me, I, that was one of my greatest failures. I didn't care about developing subordinates. Even as an army officer, I wasn't great at, I mean, I would take care of, of my soldiers, but it wasn't like I was thinking about what, what's in it from me. You know, it was always like, what's in it for me? You know, what can I, if I do X, I want to get Y in return. And that very transactional and that applied to the people that I led and worked with in many ways. Um, Ironically, there was that point at the, the last year, year and a half at West Point as the captain of the lacrosse team where that wasn't the case. And I was very much into the team and how can we maximize each individual for the betterment of the team. But then I got into the Army and the, you know, the, the civilian world and kind of abandoned that principle. Um, and so that to me now would probably be my biggest strength is just looking at, you know, trying to develop the people around me. Um, you know, I take great pride 
behind the scenes in especially empowerment of, of uh, a lot of the women that I worked with at WWP, um, giving them opportunities that they other, otherwise wouldn't get, uh, giving them a voice. You know, I had women come in and into my office and, you know, geez, I, I feel like I'm too rough or I'm, I'm too uh, edgy. And I'm like, why? Because you're a woman? You know, if you were a guy, we'd call you passionate, you know, so just be you. Um, and then putting them in positions where you support them and watch them succeed. And we rarely did we make a mistake there. So that would be, I guess the answer is, and I probably danced around it, but empowering and developing other people, which again, I was not good at that. It was not something I cared about early on. Yeah, that really is just mind blowing to to hear because I think it carousels really right into my next question. If you really had a, the we over me mentality, and I think when you say empowering others, it means so much because you're able to carry that in your professional life with your kids and then also into coaching, which is something you've really gotten deep into over the last 30 or so years now. So can you dive into that a little bit more with us about coaching sports specifically, how you really got involved in that and where where coaching became kind of a cornerstone in your life these days? So when I, um, in the Army at Fort Riley, I, the first foray into coaching and then we ended up moving to California, so that ended quickly. And then when I got to California, I started coaching, again, lacrosse, Chapman University, University of California, Irvine, and then we moved. And then when I got to Jacksonville in 97, there was no lacrosse. So I didn't coach for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I was at dinner once with a couple of buddies of mine uh, complaining about the fact that all I wanted to do was coach. And finally, one of the guys looked over at me and he goes, well, why don't you get off your rear end and go coach? And he didn't use that, you know, his language was a little bit more colorful. And I was like, ah, you know, and I found all these excuses why I shouldn't coach. The, you know, lacrosse wasn't advanced enough here. It, it, you know, I, I didn't want to waste my time. I didn't know how I'd interact with teenage boys and their parents, you know, and all of that. And finally, they really put pressure on me to just go and find somewhere to coach. And I did. And I ended up calling uh, a guy by the name of Jack Francis down at Nice High School. And, you know, he said, where'd you play? I told him where I played. And he said, can you be here tomorrow? And because they didn't have anybody focusing on the defensive side of the ball. And I said, sure. And so that began a, a long journey back into coaching. And I think it was a year or two later, um, I was leaving practice one day. And, and early on as a coach, I was very much the way that I was coached. Drill sergeant, rah, rah, all these military analogies, yelling and screaming, you know, run through a wall, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I'm still very passionate and I'm sure many would say loud, um, but I had no thought process behind being a transformational coach, developing relationships with the kids, modeling behavior that you would want them to emulate, uh, you know, talking about things like character and, and core values. And it's, you know, I don't, I don't believe in coincidences and I can't remember the parent who did this, but after practice one night, a parent came up to me and handed me a copy of the book season of life. And that was the single greatest material gift I've ever received in my entire life. Uh, cause it literally changed the course. And, and I say the single greatest and remember back to freshman year lacrosse tryouts, Tommy Singleton gave me my first defensive stick. And that was up until that minute, the most important material gift because it changed my trajectory and then season of life changed my trajectory. And I've, I've done everything I can since that, that day. And I think again, it was spring of 2008 to try to live up to the, to the lessons and the standards in that book. I've fallen short more often than I have succeeded. Um, but that gave me a blueprint for what, what success looks like. Uh, and again, it wasn't up until that point that things were even starting to come together and make sense to me. And, and when I say it changed my life, I don't just mean as a coach. It changed my life as a father, as a husband, as an employee, as an you know as a leader at you know a leader at work. Um, you know, to the point where when I left West, uh, WWP, you know, they did a little send off for me. And one of the guys there, a Marine by the name of Jason Martinez, he said, you know, he paid me the greatest compliment that I think anybody has paid me professionally. And he said, you, you made it okay for me to tell other men that I love them. And he's like, you know, explaining how, you know, that wasn't something that was thrown around in his house with his father and, you know, the other men in his life, certainly not in the workplace, certainly not in the Marine Corps. And on the day that I left there, you know, he shared that with me and we were able to look at each other in front of dozens of people and tell each other as men that we love each other. 
And that's not, that's not something I ever thought was going to be part of my life. Uh, and that, that is a direct, you know, result of, of that gift of getting the book season of life. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic book. I'd, I'd mentioned to you, I'd read it about 10 years ago and, and phenomenal. I just started rereading it recently. And, um, in the beginning of the book, they talk about the guy in the glass. Mm -hmm. I knew it when I was 18, I read that same poem. We called it the man in the mirror, but same principle of being able to not cheating the man in the mirror yeah. um, and being able to look yourself in the eye. Just a, a book chock full of principles. And, and kind of along that note, one of the things I personally am curious about, I've got three kids, you know, six to 14. You have three kids, you know, two of which we haven't talked about yet, but they played, you know, college uh, lacrosse as well. Um, obviously, your wife college athlete went to West Point what uh, I'm just curious as far as like what have been some of the guiding principles as parents you touched on this a little bit earlier about you know letting our kids fail but what have been some other philosophies that you guys have used and maybe even something that you you guys have incorporated that um, that your parents did but then maybe something different that you guys have made unique in your own family you know for for us my wife and i've had lots of conversations about this there have been times where we feel like we're too hard on our kids and and not for what you know when you think of being too hard on your kids it's i'm not talking about yelling and screaming and you know spanking and you know any, that kind of stuff i'm talking about the standards that we set for them and one that one example that my kids used to <laughs> like i drive them nuts when i would tell them this but we don't allow our kids to point fingers at others and um, use that as an excuse for either not working hard or not being a great teammate or not succeeding. Um, you know, and so when you're when you're eight, nine, ten years old and you come home and you want to complain about the coaches or the teacher or the administrator, we're like, ah. Uh -uh. And that comes from my mother. You know, as my grandfather being a high school principal and an educator. You know, when I would come home as a kid and I would start complaining about the teacher or the coach, my mom's response was basically, you know, that they own that classroom. You're just renting space. So you better figure it out because I don't want to hear. And my mother was, you know, she was tough. And we more often than not had that same response to our kids. Um, and that that's hard, you know, when you're a kid, because especially I think in society today, you know, everybody's pointing the finger. Nobody's taking responsibility, especially parents. Um, and, and look, my oldest son, Miles, who turned out to be a professional lacrosse player and was the leading goal scorer at West Point his last two years, was a horrible ninth grade lacrosse player and was benched and was not out of shape and, you know, physically soft and not very coachable. And, you know, when he would come home and, you know, he's, you know, complaining about that, we're like, no, it's not the coach's fault. You know, you need to look in the mirror and you're not going to quit. You know, that was the other thing. It's like, especially we don't, we never allowed quitting in the middle of a season. If you wanted to stop playing a sport, that's a discussion we would have, but nobody was quitting in the middle of a season. But when our kids would come to us and complain and expect, a, you know, a soft ear, that wasn't the response. You know, for us, it was look in the mirror, you know, be the man in the glass or the woman in the glass. And, you know, that's hard because as a parent, you want to, you know, kiss it and make it all better. And uh, my wife did a little bit more of that than I did, but I'm like, no, I'm, you know, we're not having that discussion. So uh, that's not something that I think is really prevalent in society right now, especially as a coach dealing with a lot of parents. When I run across a parent who is basically like, look, I don't want to hear it, you know, go out and figure it out. I'm like, man, that, that's, that's a great parent right there, in my opinion. So, yeah, I definitely agree. I think responsibility for your own actions is one of the biggest things it comes down to. Cause even at camp, that's something I harp on is kids will come running up of a situation going on, who hit who first or who was talking trash first. And the first thing I tell them is, okay, the situation's over. I don't care what happened, but how did you react? Yeah. And that's what we discuss is the reaction that you had to it and how they could have reacted differently. Or sometimes pat them on the back for they're coming over to me and tell me how angry they are that so-and-so is talking to them or push them or whatever it is. I'm like, look, you made the, the right decision. That even comes back to your discussion as what defines a tough guy or a tough girl at camp, which resonated with me so heavily as someone who was a little bit quicker for like physical aggression growing up, if you know what I'm saying. Sure. Uh, yeah. And that's something that I've thoroughly shared with the kids ever since and whether we're at flag football practice or whatever it be. So I really love that is just taking responsibility for your actions. It's something that is priceless for these kids. So I do want to take a quick step back and discuss further into the Seasons of Life book. Brian actually just gave me that one a couple months ago, and I'm going to get into it. Kevin Butler, though, who is our great university intern for the summer that spent a lot of time under your coaching at Ponte Vedra, 
he lives by that book and that was completely from your teaching and i'm sure if he was here today he'd say that was another gift from you that um was priceless just as you said it has been for you so can you get deeper into the meaning of that book the philosophies behind it and what it means to be a man built for others well first of all it's uh, you know when i first met kevin you know he was i don't know what is he six 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 seven three hundred pounds offensive lineman at ponte Vedra. and i'm the, the the character coach coming from the lacrosse team working with coach matt toblin who was an, is just an absolute gift of a football coach mm-hmm. And Kevin would have been the last guy I would have picked out and said, hey, he's going to really embrace these principles because he scared me, you know, and I'm a big guy. It's like, that's a big, strong kid. Um, and it, it, it was really, um, it meant a lot to me to, to, you know, years later to hear that that book and that experience had the impact on Kevin that it did. But long and short of, of the book was, without trying to spoil it for anybody who may be listening, you know, we're taught, especially as young men, that life is about possession, power, stuff. You know, the I think Joe refers to, I don't know if he calls them the killer bees, but you know, uh, prowess in the bedroom, on the ball field, the boardroom, and the billfold. You know, meaning if you're popular with the ladies, if you make a lot of money, if you're a great athlete, if you have a lot of stuff, that somehow means that you're a, a great man. And you know, we, we don't need to name names or even, you know, I know there are countless stories of men who have all of those things who I wouldn't trust to, you know, to sweep my garage floor. You know, like there, there's a lot of morally bankrupt men who have all of those Bs, right? But the reason the book struck such a chord with me is because I, I bought into that, you know? And, you know, I, I was, every time I was able to quote unquote achieve something, I thought that was gonna fix how I felt inside or it was gonna kind of fill the hole uh, and I talk about this openly. The last day I, I played lacrosse at West Point, I didn't realize it at the time, but there was a hole in my soul. Mm-hmm. You know, being a part of that team with those guys and that institution was, you know, one of the greatest experiences of my life. And I didn't realize that leaving it was going to create such an emptiness in many ways. I got married, had kids, had some financial success, had some professional success. And every time I checked all those boxes, I thought, okay, now I'm going to feel good about it. And it's not like I was miserable, but there was never enough. And so you go back to teaching us as men, as, as people, that it's about possession and power and all that stuff. I bought into all of that, and it was never enough. And when I, when I read the book, the solution that Joe basically puts forth uh, through Jeffrey Marx's writings is life is about three things. Success in life is about three things. It's relationships, the ability to love and be loved, which I still struggle with the ability to be loved. I'm good at loving, you know, giving, not so good at receiving. Uh, number two, commitment to a cause greater than yourself or a transcendent cause, uh, which again, my entire life, I've been surrounded by transcendent causes, but it was never what's in it from me. It was always what's in it for me. Uh, and then finally, uh, and this is something I think I've kind of added on, is living by a code of conduct fueled by your core values. You know, so one of the things that I do with the teams that I work with is that we'll go through with the kids and they will, I want every kid to, to leave a program or a season with their own set of core values. And I think if you wake up every morning thinking about what your core values are, trying to pursue them, then you can live a life of character. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to not live a life of character if you're guided by your core values. And so for me, those are the three things that I took from the book. And really, all of the work that I've done with whatever team I've been involved with has come back to those three core principles. Um, And I'm not a guy who uses a lot of military analogies. I'm not the guy, if you wanted me to work with your team, I'm not coming in and doing physical challenge stuff. I mean, there's value to that. Don't get me wrong. It's just not my thing. Um, But to me, it always comes back to those three three things. Relationships, a cause greater than self, and your character. That's fantastic. And... And, you know, one of the things and and the fact that you're pouring these principles into, I mean, the majority of a lot of the kids you're coaching nowadays, these are men between 16 and 22 and and really that pivotal age that need to hear that. And and I would venture to say at this point, you've, you know, coach or influence probably in the thousands of kids in that age group, you know, at least the high hundreds. So as a player development coach, what would you say would be the biggest things that kids in that age group, men specifically, boys that you're coaching, um, could learn the most, or what are they missing the most? And the ones that are excel, what are they excelling? You know, in terms of character development, 
what do they have that others don't? And the ones that don't have it, what do they need? So we talk a lot, especially at JU, um, you know, we talk about division one college athletes who have had immense success. Most of the kids that come to division one athlete or, you know, college programs were the best at what they do in, in, at a minimum at their high school, you know, or at least they were in the top two or three guys on the team. Then they come to look, they come to college and they, they like literally sometimes forget how to tie their shoes. Like, you know, it's how, how did you, how do you go from there to here and forget all of it? You know, and it's what they don't understand is, and this is a phrase we use all the time. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So, and I, I talked with my, um, my youngest son at Navy right now is a sophomore. We're talking about this. My oldest son didn't play basically his first two years and then was the leading goal scorer for two years. I'm like, you know, don't quit before the miracle happens is a big one because it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so trying to convince these guys that this is a four-year process. You know, there's the rare kid who comes in as a freshman and he's a starter, right? There's the freshman All-American in every sport. But the majority of guys are what I call program guys. So you come in and you're going to have to figure out it's a marathon, not a sprint. And then what's your role? And how do you accept the fact that you may not be a starter or a statistical superstar with that doesn't mean you shouldn't continue to work hard and give everything you can to the team? Again, being a great teammate, relationships, putting the team before yourself, a cause greater than self, doing well in the classroom, treating women in, on campus the right way, being respectful to your professors, showing up on time, doing your homework, not, you know, staying out of jail, don't get on the dean's, you know, list. I mean, the, the bad dean's list. You know, those are things that you look at and say, that's your character. You know, those are your, you know, that's what your, those three things. Um, and, but trying to explain to an 18, 19 year old kid who's had almost instant gratification in the sport for the last 12 years, it's a process. Um, that is a huge challenge. And some guys quit. You know, we, again, we, we brought in 20 freshmen and three transfers this year at JU. I hope, well, I think all the transfers will be fine because I think they're all one year guys, but I hope all 20 of those freshmen are here in four years. You know, I hope they graduate on time and go on to do great things. And I hope they play lacrosse the whole time. But history has proven that we're probably, we'd be lucky if 11 of those guys are still lacrosse players in four years. And that's, again, I think kids quit before the miracle happens. Um, one of the you know greatest stories from my time at JU is a guy by the name of Derek Andrake, who came from upstate New York from a very good high school program. But, you know, Derek's not the biggest, strongest, fastest guy. He's not the most skilled guy. He, you know, he, genetically not the most, you know, gifted guy. And he came to JU thinking he was going to come in and immediately make a contribution. I think it was his freshman year. After practice, he, hey, coach, can I talk to you? We went and sat on the sidelines, sat on the bleachers after practice, just the two of us. You know, and I, I looked over at him and, you know, his, his chin was trembling. I'm like, what's wrong? Coach, I suck. I, I, I'm the worst player on the team. Guys don't want to do drills with me. I shouldn't be here. I was like, Derek, hold on. Well, well, first of all, where's all this coming from? And then it was kind of peeling back the layers of the onion and realizing that, hey, man, I'm not going to lie to you. You may spend four years here and never factor statistically, but that doesn't mean you're not an important part of this program. Yeah, well, what, what's that mean, coach? They're like, what are you doing in the weight room? He, again, not the strongest, but that dude worked his rear end off in the weight room. You know, didn't factor statistically for four years, but when we scored a goal, he's running up and down the sideline, fist bumping every person, including the coaches on the sidelines, celebrating for his teammates, his cause greater than self. Wouldn't you know it, Derek Andrake ended up as a two-time team captain and a grad assistant at JU. And he is, and I, I've shared, he knows I tell this story. This is a kid who's sitting on a, on a, you know, a bench on the side of you know, the field after practice one day, thinking that he's the worst thing that's ever happened to JU lacrosse. He has left an indelible mark on our program and never factored statistically. Now, you take kids that are fantastic athletes in high school, fantastic students, homecoming kings or queens, and all of a sudden those things don't, you know, those possess, that stuff, right? The killer bees, they don't start to happen, but then you got to figure out, okay, A, that's okay. B, there's beauty in the struggle, you know, the, the process. And C, figure out a different way to contribute. So that, that's a long answer, by the I way, but it. that's really, that's my role is yeah. trying to make sure that the guy, we break the roster down into thirds. There's no science behind this. If you've got 45 kids on your roster, I can tell you that the top 15 kids, they're going to play. The middle 15 kids kind of depends on the injury report and the scouting report. 
the bottom 15 kids, probably not going to play basketball, five, five, and five. You know, it's mm-hmm. the same thing, right? And so I tell our kids that you may be in the bottom 15 for four years. That doesn't mean you don't have value here. But you got to buy into that fact. I can't do it for you. You've got to accept the fact that you can give everything you possibly can, cause greater than self, to the team for your teammates, relationships, and do it the right way. And we were going to, we're going to look at you as a success. So, yeah, I love that so much because that's something we even try to incorporate. Brian, I assist Brian coaching his kids' sports. And that's something we try to figure out is, you know, if you're not the number one player, if this is your first, mind you, these are six, seven, eight-year-olds. So it's, if you're just starting and you're not the best player out there, how can you contribute when you're not on the field? And I think that's something that a lot of people lack is they want to hit the game-winning shot or the game-winning field goal or drop 20 points a game. Uh, But when they don't get that or they don't get the stats they want, it's like complete heartbreak. It's a sign that they want to give up. So I think that's super important for everyone to grasp at home. The next question I really want to ask is, a lot of, you probably really understand these days, a lot of people lack direction. You know, a lot of people there coming out of high school or even college, just as you talk about that hole that you were left with after you left West Point, that's something that a lot of people are currently going through. I know I went through it graduating during COVID, just trying to find that direction. And your story about being a walk-on on the lacrosse team made me think about the difference between pursuing passion and pursuing opportunity. So what have you learned from that experience of, taking a leap of faith, going for the lacrosse, walk on the lacrosse team, give up your opportunity as a scholarship soccer player. What have you learned from that? And what advice would you have for other people? They're kind of trying to guide those next steps in their life. Yeah. You know, that's a tough one because you can miss, I think, misconstrue what I'm about to say. When I, I'm going to like take it from a different angle professionally i've never said to myself this is well i've only said it once it's when i chose to leave wwp i wanted to pursue executive coaching and cultural development and team building um and then i ended up doing that but each time i would try to you know go like full force into it i would i had a job offer (laughs) so and which i basically couldn't say no to a couple of these opportunities but i've always stayed involved in that side it's just never been my full-time Full focus, you know, yeah, commitment. And so, you know, you can, I think, take this the wrong way. It's, oh, pursue your passion. Well, I also am married with three children. I have to pay the bills, <laughs> you know, so, I, and some would say, oh, you know, burn the boats, you know, jump off the cliff, figure out how to fly. And I've heard all of that stuff. Well, that may work for some. That didn't, that's not my path. And so I've made decisions with my career that make really no logical sense but they've allowed me to do the things that I'm passionate about. Um, There's a guy named Pat McManaman who runs Sandler Sales here in Jacksonville. And years ago, he was coaching me as a salesman. And I was like, ah, it's not about the money. It's not about the money. He's like, okay, but if you're successful with sales and the money follows, that's gonna free you up to be able to do the things that you are passionate about. And I never forgot that. So I've always kind of had my full-time job, which I've always given 100% to, and I think done fairly well in, but I've stayed involved in other things that have been able to, you know, satiate that, that passion, you know, and, or fuel the passion. And a lot of that's come down to coaching. And up until recently with bowls, I hadn't blown a whistle in like four years. I was a lacrosse coach, but I wasn't a lacrosse coach. I was the character development or leadership coach. And so for me, it's important. Yeah. Follow your passion, but also recognize that you've got responsibilities or if you don't, by all means go, you know, like I look at my oldest son who I don't know whether he'll stay in the army or get out, but there's a part of me that doesn't want him to get married and have kids before that decision, you know, comes because like, Hey, no baggage, you know, do whatever you want to do. And if you're going to fail, you get to fail alone. Or if you're going to get to, you know, succeed, great. Then when you do find a wife and have kids, you know, it'll all be there for you. Um, so again, that may be kind of a weird answer to that question, but for me, it's always been balancing, following your passion with the responsibility that you have. I got similar advice when I was younger. He told me, follow opportunity and it'll lead you to your passion. Almost as if you kind of got to pay the piper, pay your dues at the lower level and you never know where it might lead. So I think that's definitely applicable for a lot of people out there. They're trying to navigate that next step. Well, the other one too, is like, especially at Wounded Warrior Project, the, you know, director of people, director of development or chief development officer, chief program officer, there was a job to do there. But while I was there, you want to talk about indulging my passion. 
that's where I fell in love with character development, team building, cultural development, mission, vision, values. I mean, that, that was really the experience that, and I was so lucky to be a part of an executive team that said, by all means, you can be the guy. I mean, we all bought into it, no doubt, and had full on support from the executive team. But that was my, my thing. Like we all had our things and that was, while I was doing, you know, raising money or leading the program team, it was always, you know, hand in hand with team building, cultural development, coaching, uh, making sure that people were being challenged, given opportunities. Um, and that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's why I love athletic coaching because it's the same thing. Yeah. And it sounds like too, you've referenced this a couple of times, you know, alluding to your, you know, third or fourth year of playing lacrosse, you know, you were kind of a me guy, but then something kind of changed, you know, that third or fourth year of playing lacrosse. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Was there a specific instance or something that over the course of that season, you felt like you learned about yourself? Kevin O'Rourke, a uh, redheaded Irish kid from, you know, middle-class Long Island. And Kevin and I were, he was, I'm class of 93. He's class of 94. And uh, Kevin and I were constantly butting heads. And from my perspective, part of it was that I saw this big, strong kid who was a great midfielder who never fully bought into some of the things that we were trying to do as a team. Not that I knew relationships that caused greater than self and character back then, but he was just always fighting the system to include the team. Or at least that was, you know, since the world revolved around me back then, that, that was my perspective, right? And Kevin equally would push back on me. And I can't remember what it was for. But sometime during my junior year and his sophomore year, he and I ended up, as I remember it, we ended up in a car on the way to Long Island because we were taking leave for the weekend. And if you drive from West Point to you know anywhere in central Long Island, it should be about an hour and 15 minute drive. Well, if you know anything about New York and Long Island traffic, an hour and 15 minute drive can take three and a half hours, which this one did. And during that car ride, I got to know Kevin O'Rourke. And this is why Season of Life resonated so much with me. The first two years of our relationship, as I was yelling at him and he was yelling at me, it was very transactional because I didn't know Kevin O'Rourke. I didn't know anything about him. I didn't care about him, to be honest. And he didn't know anything about me, probably didn't care about me. That was the beginning of our, our relationship, in my opinion, was that time we spent together. And then collectively as a class, when we became seniors, it was we were adamant about making sure that we included the whole team in all of the things we did, good and bad. <laughs> and so I got to know Kevin O'Rourke. And I look back on, there were times where Kevin and I were, were literally almost come to blows in practice and saying inappropriate things to one another and challenging each other. And then all of a sudden I got to know him and we were no less competitive. We didn't challenge each other less as lacrosse players, but that was because we were able to do that because we had a relationship with one another. And that's another lesson that I share with our guys. If you don't know someone, there's almost nothing you can say. But once you get to know someone and have a relationship with them, there's almost nothing you can't say. And so that, for me, that was the turning point. That was, and, I, and I've shared that story with Kevin. We're still in touch to this day. We're on a text thread right now. Um, and, you know, I've, I've told him, I mean, that, that was one of those moments that was, that, that led to our success. From my perspective, a lot of our success because our relationship was emblematic of the relationships on the team going into 93. And that team was eighth in the country, made it to the NCAA tournament quarterfinals and set the, the record for wins in a season at, at Army. Um, and so it was, it was guys like Kevin O'Rourke that made that, that possible. Wow. Okay, let me ask one more, Kev, uh, Colby, and then you can take it home. But it remi that part reminds me of, remember the Titans, where the offensive guy and the defensive guy – you yeah. know, become a unit yeah. and the team totally transforms. So that's what a fan. And I appreciate you sharing that because it really uh, ties together a lot of things that you said earlier. Um, one last question I wanted to ask, because even though a lot of our listeners may never coach, you know, a high school kid, you know, in lacrosse, but almost everyone does have someone in that kind of age 16 to 22 male that is, you know, um, I was that age, I've got three boys. I understand it's a tough age to kind of get through. How do you start that conversation? You know, obviously as a player development coach, you're coming with kids that don't know who you are. Um, how do you start that conversation or any advice on um, building that relationship, where to start from? So one of the things that, that I do with, with JU and Bowles is um, I try to take guys out for breakfast. 
uh, or coffee or lunch. You know, we don't do a lot in the evening because of, you know, whatever the family time practice studying. Um, but especially in the off season, you know, being able to meet at university diner or Metro diner and just, you know, and, and I take two or three guys out, um, cause it's, it's sometime can be awkward for younger guys when you get an older guy and it's just a one-on-one -on -one thing. Um, and I used to do this at wounded warrior project, believe it or not, we would go to lunch and I would, I would take three of my three or four of my teammates from WWP out to lunch. And the only rule was we weren't allowed to talk about work. And so we do the same thing with lacrosse. You know, we'll go out, we'll go to, again, sit down, you know, eat. And I don't want to talk about lacrosse. Now, if one of our players, especially at the high school level, really needs to talk about their recruiting process, you know, or what club team they should be playing for in the summer, obviously I'm not going to ignore the questions. But the primary goal is go out and don't talk about work, don't talk about sports. And so what can you talk about? You talk about what's going on at home. You talk about what's going on in the classroom. You talk about what's going on with the girlfriends. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's really amazing. Some guys are never going to open up to you and that's okay. They just need to know that you're there for them or there are other resources. You know, we've got a mental health clinic at JU. Uh, we bring in nonprofits that focus on things like relationship, uh, the, the one love foundation, preventing relationship violence, you know, and there's a laundry list of others. Um, to, but making sure that guys have resources so they never feel like they're alone, but it's really just trying to get to know them. Um, now, I'm 51 years old. I don't need 17 year old friends, you know, and that's, when you, you know, if when I was 17, if you'd have said that, I'm like, well, that's kind of screwed up. But no, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an old, older man with a wife and three kids, but I can be here for you, you know, and, and, I, and I'm not trying to replace your dad or your grandfather. I'm just here as another resource for you because we're all dealing with something. Um, and, you know, most of our guys... They, you know, there's a movie, I don't know if you've heard of this one, but it's called The Mask We Live In or The Mask You Live In. Joe's in it, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's a great, it's, it's great, but it's also scary. It basically says that as men, we wake up, up every morning, and we put a mask on. And that's how we go through our day. Well, most of the kids I'm dealing with are walking through life with a mask on. They don't want you to see behind the mask. They don't want you to see what's really going on. And the only way to do that is to start asking them questions and getting to know them and then understanding that there's a line that we don't know where that line is, but there's a line you don't want to cross, you know? So, um, again, for some it's easier for others. It, you just, it, you're never going to break through. So, yeah, I think the most important part that I took away from that right there is just, I feel like where that, I wouldn't necessarily where that line is, is, but I think a, a person who isn't your friend is going to tell you exactly what you don't want to hear. Now, some people might say the opposite. If like you know, a friend, a true friend, someone's going to tell you something you don't want to hear. But that's one of the biggest things I've learned through leadership and working with young people is that it's hard in your mind. You aren't their friend after you tell them something you don't want to hear, especially when they're 10, 11, 12 years old, when you kind of put them in that uncomfortable position and maybe call them out on some of the stuff they're doing that isn't good for them, that isn't going to be long term helping them help helping them reach their goals, that's kind of when you become not as much of a friend in their eyes. Uh, so it's definitely a, a, a tough balance beam to be on. And I think that's really incredible that you've been able to break down those barriers and build those relationships with these guys, but also guide them down the right path at the same time. So one of our last few questions here, you've been deep into coaching, uh, very accomplished in the professional world and sales and leadership and things like that. And obviously as a father, I'm sure you're very proud of your three kids that you've brought up and they're all doing amazing things. Can you tell us, do you have a plan for your future now? You know, five, 10, 15 years, do you have any ultimate goal that you're trying to reach over the, the, you know, next quarter century or yeah, quarter century or so that you've got what's really in the plans for you next? Not really. You know, and, I, and I mentioned uh, before we sat down today, you know, my goal is to just simply try to figure out how to do the next right thing. Um, and I don't know what that's going to be. You know, I, my wife and I have talked about what an ideal retirement age would be. Um, you know, I've thought about maybe when my one of the reasons I haven't pursued college lacrosse coaching full time is that it struck me about six or seven years ago that if I did that, I wouldn't be able to watch my sons play because I would be coaching while they were play, both Division One lacrosse players. Um, so I think about potentially being a 54 year old, a first time assistant coach, um, when my youngest son uh, graduates from Navy. Um, but no, I, I mean, I'm pretty happy doing what I'm doing right now. And, you know, obviously 
got bills to pay and a retirement to to you know in, continue to invest in. But what really fuels me is being able to stay involved with the, the JU team, the Bulls team. Um, I refuse to miss opportunities to be a dad, and so I don't know that there's a goal in the next 10 or 15 years whether that I'll have the same you know thought process about being a grandfather. But I just refuse to miss those moments that I pretty much missed for a lot a lot of time when I was you know, out there grinding and selling and making money and traveling all over the place. You know, I get the opportunity to drive my with my daughter from Corpus Christi to Jacksonville when she and her fiance moved back. I get a chance to drive my son, with my son Miles from Fort Benning to Fort Riley last summer. You know, we just came back from Annapolis this weekend to see Max uh, at Navy. So, you know, those are the kinds of things I, I don't want to, I want to do what I need to do to put myself in a position to not say no to being present for my kids um, and then I just want to continue to coach and, and, you know, do the character development stuff and, and be a great employee. You know, I mean, it's, um, if I can do those things for the next 10 or 15 years, I'll be, I'll be pretty happy. Yeah. It's amazing. Just a persistent pursuit of whatever it might be. And I love the idea of just remaining present. I think that's yeah. one more day as your biggest concern right now to be there for your kids, the people in your companies, keep coaching all the teams. And I know Bulls had an incredible season this past year, state runner up for the second year correct or uh final four yeah final four we, we lost in the final four both years so. yeah so definitely making an impact there and we're super excited to keep up i'm really happy we were able to have you here today it was a thrill to have you at grit camp earlier this summer as well so much so much just enriching values and principles that were shared that day with the kids i love it too because nothing beats i'm sure you understand as a coach when you're harping on something day after day you bring an exterior person in and they say the exact same thing you've yeah. been trying to get yeah. across. Uh, so just my last question for today, as you know, we really built everything grit.org on our grit creed. So as you're familiar with it, what part of the grit creed resonates most with you and why? Yeah. And, and it, it, I'll butcher this, but uh, I don't find an excuse. I find a way that I say that, Perfect. right? That, and I think that's the number two, uh, the, or listed number two on the grit creed. And it jumped out at me. And, and again, I, um, that was one of the things that I kind of alluded to earlier with being hard on our kids. You know, it's, we're, we're not about excuses. Um, and for me, failure is acceptable. Failure is not fatal. So if, if something goes wrong, I'm not going to make an excuse for it. I'm going to own it. You know, Jocko Willing, Willing's book, Extreme Ownership, is fantastic examples of when things go really, really poorly. If you're a great leader, you're going to own your role in it. And you're not going to point fingers. Um, I don't know the man. But I watched something that the new LSU coach said this weekend about his player, and it made me want to jump into the TV screen. I was so angry. Um, you know, it basically trying to say something nice about a kid, but literally putting the onus of a loss on a kid who screwed up on special teams, I just thought was a horrible example of leadership. Um, and to me, um, I'm also not in the business of apologizing for things I have not done. <laughs> but when things go wrong, and it, it was my fault, uh, or it was my responsibility, I'm not going to make an excuse. I love that. I'm glad you like that one. Well, we really appreciate you coming on today, Adam. It's really been a pleasure. So that's a wrap for today here at the Grit.org podcast. Please check out our other episodes. Leave us a comment. Tell us something you enjoyed about Adam's story. Share this with someone you think it would resonate with or impact. As always, we appreciate you tuning in for another episode of the Grit.org podcast. <laughs>